Um, yes, as many of you are aware, I'm, uh, I'm formerly OGS. I was the science leader for geochemistry at the OGS, and um, now I'm I'm the um, senior geochemist at Matrix Solutions here in Guelph, not too far from where this is being held. And I'd like to acknowledge my um, my colleague Louis Charles Boutin, who I've worked with for uh, most of the time that I've been been at uh, Matrix, and we've worked on subject matter which is very similar to what I'm talking about today. So. Uh, I guess uh, next slide, is that right? Yeah. yeah. OK, so just an outline. I'm going to uh, give a sort of basic introduction about the sort of the, the problem in Ontario with hydrogen sulfide. Um, I'm going to talk about H2S in groundwater versus theoretical gas concentrations, and that's important because H2S is mainly a problem for human beings when it's in, in gas form. It's not such a problem in groundwater. It's not that toxic. Uh, so uh, to ingest, it's it's very tough, toxic to breathe, especially at high concentrations. And then I'll talk about the dangers of uh, uh, of groundwater and H2S in confined spaces. It's uh, an up and coming problem and something we have to be aware of uh, from basically from this point forward. And then the uh, the top one percent. So I'll talk about the highest concentrations we see in Ontario. And then finally, I put this sort of whole thing in context. And I'd like the key takeaway I want to kind of leave you with is that when we look at it in context, in context these problems that we have with legacy gas wells in Ontario are understandable and I think they're manageable. That's not something I would have said even five years ago, but I've, I've seen enough now and I know enough that I think that that within in, in the broader context of the industry, I think we're going to be able to deal with these issues uh, in our lifetime and um, uh, as long as I hope I live a natural life. Um, OK, so next slide, please. Um, OK, so the problem really don't, with legacy, legacy gas wells has been in the news a lot lately. We've heard you know, places like Wheatley, Marantet Beach, uh, Forestry Farm Road. These are areas that are in the news all the time. There have been at least half a dozen uh, Global Mail articles on this, and quite a few local newspapers cover this a lot when it happens locally, like in the uh, in the Wheatley area, for example. And uh, some of these these uh, issues with legacy hydrocarbon infrastructure have caused problems, including f injuries and fatalities. And um, this presentation focuses on the related problem of hydrogen sulfide, which is a potentially dead to gas that can be a direct or indirect consequence of legacy gas well in infrastructure. And it's really the indirect consequences that I'm, I'm focusing on. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this would be the sort of direct um, uh, consequences. Uh, this is uh, um, when you have hydrogen sulfide in in um, natural gas, it's called sour gas. And in Alberta, they have sour gas concentrations in natural gas that, that are sometimes up to 70%. So these, these are incredibly high concentrations of sour gas. And uh, a lot of people from Eastern Canada wouldn't have seen these large sulfur piles or sulfur pyramids they have out there. Um, just to put it in perspective, at the base of that pyramid is a normal sized, uh, I don't know if my mouse will work here, probably not, but uh, it, the, there's a normal sized um, two lane road down there. Uh, that pile must be close to 100 feet tall and th that's quite normal out there when, when the price of sulfur is low you see the piles build and then the price of sulfur goes up and then the piles all disappear and that all comes from from uh, or a lot of it comes from uh, removal from sour gas now we don't see that so much in ontario in fact i've never seen in ontario we the first sweetening plant in canada was in ontario down near port alma uh, back in the 20s i believe and um, we we do have sour gas, but it's about two percent uh, uh, H2S, and that's two percent far above the instantly lethal concentration of of 0.1 percent, which is a thousand ppm. So it's something we have to be concerned with. But that is comparatively rare in Ontario, fortunately, and except in the southwest of Ontario, in two particular geological units, the Guelph Formation and the A1 A2 carbonates, and the Salina Group. Um, uh, and these occur in particular areas in Essex and in, in, in Kent County. So they are an issue. I don't want to minimize them. They're important, uh, but they're probably only important in that area. And so that's not really what I'm going to be talking so much about. Um, I'll be talking about, like I said, the secondary effects. So next slide, please. So naturally occurring uh, hydrogen sulfide occurs in groundwater. It's widespread. Um, uh, half of all drilled wells uh, of supplying water to houses have some H2S in it. And at small concentrations, it's not a problem at all. I had it in my well water when I was a kid. Um, and um, uh, it can be related to human activities. Sometimes it's, again, benign, small concentrations. But when the con concentrations are very high, uh, quite often that is something to do with drilling activities um, and, and drilling infrastructure. Uh, and this can again be either directly um, uh, directly, or directly released as in the case of sour gas 
or in the case of something called sulfur water, which we won't really talk about, or more commonly, it's brought together it's by, because of bringing together of two incompatible materials that react to generate hydrogen sulf sulfide as a byproduct. So next, um, um, thanks. Yeah, so these are the two in incompatible materials, and I think many people here would know this. It's when you add methane to sulfate, you end up getting this uh, uh, this this hydrogen sulfide is, is generated as a byproduct. It doesn't happen spontaneously. It's usually, usually mediated by bacteria, and I'll show you in a second. But notice on these two slides, these are from the OGS uh, Ambient Groundwater Geochemistry Database, which you can download if you want, and I, I do regularly as a, a consultant. <laughs> And of course, um, uh, and I, of course, I helped to help to uh, build this thing in the first place. But you'll notice on the, on the left, the methane, uh, where you get methane, uh, you don't get sulfate, uh, uh, as you can see on the right. So they're in, in different areas. And the reason is when they're together, they basically annihilate each other like the proverbial snowball uh, in hell. And so they just, they, they, these are very rapid reactions. They occur, geologically speaking, extremely rapidly. And so you don't get the two together. Can I have the next slide, please? And down one, please. Thanks. So in groundwater, this reaction takes place almost always. It's, uh, it's microbial, uh, microbially mediated, uh, and that yields biogenic H2S, which has a particular isotopic si signature, so we can we can see it. We know when it happens. And thank you. That's good. Perfect. And so methane and sulfate uh, uh, don't cause na exist naturally, like I said, because the reaction is too fast. And so it, it's around for a little bit of time. But if you happen to measure it, you're measuring something kinetic. Next slide. Next, please. Thanks. And so when they do occur together, it usually means that something very kinetic is occurring, and that usually means human beings are involved. And that often uh, it results from methane being put into a sulfate-rich aquifer somehow or sulfate-rich fluids being put into a met methane-rich aquifer. And you can see, uh, I'm showing you some pictures of some slimy bacteria. There. Those are actually sulfur oxidizing bacteria. Uh, it's, a, it's hard to get a picture of sulfur reducing bacteria. They just leave this black muck everywhere. So uh, that one I'm putting in there is a, a bit of a filler. So next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit of chemistry here. You'll remember this from, from chemistry class, uh, love or hate it, and that's Henry's law, and that is that H2S is extremely soluble and it will partition into a gas phase if present. Most gases, dissolved gases will, in fact, all will. And uh, this is uh, um, a problem uh, where the problem lies again because H2S is extremely toxic. So Henry, Henry's law states that the proportion of uh, of the, the concentration in the aqueous phase is proportional to the concentration in, in the vapor phase. And that little K there is the Henry's law constant, and that's the uh, the concept of, of proportionality. And so that is, uh, that the, the temperature affects that. Uh, but in the case of H2S, unlike some other gases, there's a, there's a slight complication, and that is uh, H2S used to, uh, the old fashioned word for it is acid gas. H2S is an acid, and so we have to um, consider uh, the pH of the solution too. Next slide, please. And so if you uh, probably again remember this from first year, uh, neutral pHs, H2S and, and, uh, and HS minus are the dominant species uh, when sulfide is dissolved in water. So the proportion of each depends on pH, below five, almost all of it's H2S, above nine, almost, al almost all of it's HS minus, and that matters because HS minus is not volatile. So when the pH rises, uh, the amount of uh, sulfide that can make it into solution rises too until it gets to about 10. And once pH gets to 10, then you, there is no smell. You can shake the water all you want, you won't smell it. Uh, and the the um, the sulfide is pretty much locked in the solution. So to know how much will partition into air, we need to add the acid dissociation reaction, and which we've done. So next slide, please. So you don't have to do it, and here it is. These are the, on the bottom scale is the hydrogen sulfate concentrations in groundwater for 31, 3,182 drilled well samples from the OGS database. And um, these are samples that have non-null H2S data. And so they obviously the zeros are not plotted here. That's fine, that's one, thanks. And so 99% of these were, were sampled uh, or rather measured using a test kit, a field test kit, which is more accurate at the lower concentrations. Uh, but in the upper concentrations, um, the very high concentrations, we have to either do dilutions with that kit because it only measures to 11 milligrams per liter, or we, we take the sample, we preserve it and bring it into the lab and they can measure it in the lab. So next, please. So that is the uh, 0 0.005 is about the, uh, the, the, the above 0 0.005. We have 55% um, uh, of all wells in Ontario are above that. Uh, and that is detectable by smell. Next one, please. 0 0.01 uh, is the detection limit of this instrument, so we ought, would often shake the bottle, smell it, and if uh, we got a got a smell, then we would um, 
uh, we'd record less than 0 0.01. If we if we didn't, it would be zero. And and uh, and so the next one, yes, that's that's um, one milligram per liter, 256 uh, samples out of the entire batch, and that's eight percent of them. And the next one, please. And 10 milligrams per liter. There were 41 samples with 10 milligrams per liter. 10 milligrams per liter is an awful lot of H2S in water, as you'll see in a second. Next, next slide, please. So, um, next, please. So, um, this is try to put it in context. At 15 milligrams per liter, uh, if you look down on the on the on the x-axis, uh, to get about 15 milligrams per liter, you only need about 0.1 milligrams per liter. That's the short-term exposure limit for H2S. So the theoretical gas concentration for 0.1 milligrams per liter is is um, is 15 milligrams per liter, the same as Estelle. Next, please. And so for the uh, lower lethal limit, which is 100 ppm, uh, that's about one milligram per liter. Uh, so we we um, uh, we about, uh, as I said, about 8% of all groundwater samples, these include drinking water samples, can potentially produce lethal H2S, but there's a, a caveat to that. It's not it's not quite that simple. And then next one, please. And so that that number of around 10, that's pretty close to the what you could produce, uh, what what you would need in ground groundwater to uh, produce up to um, or, 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 or a thousand milligrams or sorry, parts per million, which is the pretty much the point of instant death. So you could you can die very quickly. Um, with that, and the knockout uh, concentration is about 700 ppm. And inter uh, as I said, 1.3%, about 1% of waters and ground of groundwater in Ontario have that, and some of these are domestic wells. So, um, next slide, please. Um, so the issue is that um, uh, the evaporation of H2S removes acid, as I said, and that right raises pH, and that limits further evaporation. So in other words, the volatilization of H2S is fortunately self-limiting, which is why we don't have more problems than we do. As the pH rises, that prevents the, the, the release of the rest of the, the uh, H2S that's in solution. And so with equal amounts of water and gas, it's actually very difficult for high con vapor concentrations to develop in a confined space. And the, the exceptions to this are, are where mechanisms exist to prevent the pH rise, and that includes acidification. So there are some uh, water treatment techniques that acidify water in domestic situations or in, in farms, and then large quantities of water uh, with, with small quantities of gas. So if you get gas bubbles coming up at a spring, for example, and that gas has been uh, exposed to an awful lot of water in the subsurface, you can have the, the maximum theoretical concentration that I just showed you develop. And so if you get 10 milligrams per liter, you better not be sticking your, your face too close to the bubbles because you could you could have a, a lethal concentration uh, from that. And then finally, we're flowing water meets confined air, and that's a big problem. So next slide, please. So examples of that would, would be um, uh, of the criterion uh, where you have very high water air ratios is a tunnel uh, that you know that needs constant drainage. Now tunnels uh, are usually well ventilated uh, for this reason, but there could be areas in the tunnel like off uh, uh, drifts or whatnot where where uh, um, H2S can collect. A foundation drainage where a lot of um, um, water moves in and the sump is a particular problem because H2S is heavier than air. A milk house, they use a lot of water in milk houses to relieve the water running. A shower, if you went and answered the phone, left the shower running and you had one milligram per liter in your water, which many people do, as I said, 8% of people, uh, you could come back and have a, a real problem. And then a laundry room, I, I used to have a, a, um, uh, a, a uh, washing machine that would run on. And if that happened, then this, this could the, the, the water goes down the drain, but the, 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 the um, gas builds up in the room. So, and finally, systems designed to remove H2S that involve confined spaces like storage tanks and crops and board wells. And I, I'm sorry to, to be the, have to report this, but there's actually been a fairly recent fatality uh, that that uh, occurred uh, exactly because of this. And when I first joined uh, Matrix, the, the very first day I got there, uh, this job landed on my on my plate, and it was a very sad situation where someone had gone inside their well to fix a uh, something in the well, and uh, and uh, he died um, uh, fairly fairly quite quickly. And um, when we investigated that, we found that there there were concentrations of up to 12,000 uh, parts per million in, in that that atmosphere of that well. And that it was, we, we were shocked to see that. I've been doing this all my career and I've never seen anything like that. And that turns out to be the maximum theoretical, theoretical concentration that you could develop from that, that, that fluid. And the reason was this water was pouring into the water, pouring into that well and these concentrations rose. And I should say the family has allowed me to share these details because they're very concerned that these sorts of things occur elsewhere, and I know they do. 
uh, and um, uh, they don't want to see this happen to anybody else. So uh, I am I have been allowed to to uh, uh, share the details on this. So next slide, please. And so, like I said, these things do occur elsewhere. These are not from that that site, but they're they're, they're similar situations where people over the course of three and a half or four thousand wells that I sampled across southern Ontario. Uh, we saw these cases. This is a storage tank on the right here. That pink stuff is, is bacteria that's building up and that guy there sticking his hand in should know better than what he's doing. That's actually me. Uh, and I, to be honest, I would not do that now. Knowing what I know now, I would not take the lid off that tank, even though it's in a barn and it seemed to be well ventilated. Uh, that was a bad idea. And this is another case on the left where they were pouring it into a dug well, a similar situation uh, to, to other cases I've seen. And, uh, and that, that stuff on top there is, is elemental sulfur. Next slide, please. This one is a real problem because H2S, I said, as I said, is heavier than, than air, the one on the left. And so you can build that up. They were spraying the H2S water into the tank and then pumping it out and using it for a gardening, I can't remember. Uh, but that's a real problem. We don't go into those types of situations, but that is that is really dangerous. That one on the right is far better, but it's not very good for the fish because uh, it's extremely toxic to, to aquatic life, far more so than than, uh, than to, to humans even, because there I think the lower lethal concentration is 0 0.002 for fish, and that's a very low number. So next slide, please. And so that little that little green triangle up there is the concentration that was in that well uh, at the bottom. These are not theoretical concentrations, either the actual concentrations of water versus gas. And you can see that they meet the theoretical maximum that you can develop. And they're not even the highest concentrations we measured. We've measured several that are higher than only one shown up there. That one that's higher than it, we had 400 milligrams per liter in water. And that was a domestic well that somebody had been using. They're not using now. And they're looking, in fact, that well has been abandoned. But that that uh, we, that was encountered. So next slide, please. So uh, next one again. So the median of of all the detected samples that we saw was 0.005, uh, and um, that's a fairly high number. Uh, you would, it's quite offensive in water. Next slide. Oh, next one, please. Uh, we're going to focus on 10 milligrams per liter. It's the extreme, it's the highest, and it's always better to focus on the highest to try and figure things out. So H2S is extremely reactive, and it precipitates immediately uh any any metal that it contacts and so if there's metals in in solution and there always are then you end up uh, losing them the h2s and so it's geologically ephemeral it's actually quite unusual to see h2s in groundwater worldwide but we see it all over the place in ontario and next slide please and the reason so the question is where does it come from next slide please and where it mostly comes from is is the glacial sediments. Uh, the quaternary geologists will, will the OGS will tell you that they're often full of organic material, and that organic material reduces any any organic sulfur compounds. So we get a little bit of H2S in our water, nothing serious, but uh, we get it across most of our groundwaters in Ontario that are reducing, and that's partly due to the glacial sediments that overlie them. So next slide, please. The real question is, what? where do these really high ones come from? Because you need a constant effect, uh, source that, that, uh, that is at a kinetic source to add it. And it turns out that almost all of these are, are have, have uh, a oil and gas well association. Next, please. So if you look, if you plot sulfate against methane, so sulfate at the bottom, methane on the, on the y-axis, you can see that uh, as expected, most in most cases of the, of the 3,000 cases, they plot right along the axes. Uh, there are a few dozen cases where things plot in the middle there. Next slide, please. Uh, and those big round circles are proportional to hydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen sulfide is being generated in these cases. Next, please. And so the highest H2S samples approach the origin because they're trending towards uh, one or both of the axes. Only three of these, uh, of these 41, do not have methane. So there, as I said, methane is not supposed to be there with all that, that sulfate, and yet they have methane. Only three don't, and those three are shown in blue there down the bottom. And those are on the Niagara Peninsula, and I believe that's a case where we have gas moving into a very, very sulfate-rich aquifer, and the gas does a snowball thing. It, it gets used up very quickly, the gas, and so it's the limiting, limiting re, uh, reactant, and we end up with just hydrogen sulfide. So next, please. Uh, so um, we can use sulfide so to find out where a lot, of, a lot of this stuff is coming from. And so next, please. Um, you can see there 28, uh, 28 per mil. That's this. These are the all the, the water sampled in the Salina formation. Next, please. And the only exceptions to that that 28 per mil trend are these ones down here, and that's the exogenic sulfate trend that Caitlin Small found in her thesis in 2017. 
and uh, that sulfate is coming from below. So that sulfate is coming up from deep, deep down on the Niagara Peninsula in a very particular trend across the peninsula, and it's been related to movement of deep sulfur-rich fluids from, from the uh, Queenston Formation, which is two or 300 meters down, and it's moving up abandoned gas wells, uh, because on, on the Niagara Peninsula, there are upward gradients, and they're bringing these fluids up. But that's not really the point of this talk at the moment. So next, please. So in fact, that's a talk in itself. So looking at the Lucas Formation, we also get a fairly distinct trend in there, and that's because these are marine sulfates, and the gypsum in, the forma in, in that, those formations give off a particular um, sulfur isotopic signal. Next, please. But when you when you look at the uh, these 41 gas wells, you can see that they start ar around um, Saurian marine evaporites, but they tend to go rocketing upward. As you lose sulfate, the, the, the compositions of delta, uh, delta F34 go up, way up. And in some cases, we had them over 110, I think it was. That's extremely enriched for sulfur isotopes. And it happens because the lighter isotope is disappearing off into the hydrogen sulfide, which is being produced, and the heavy isotope is getting concentrated in the, in the residual sulfate. So this is a dead ringer for the interaction of, of, um, uh, of natural gas with, with, uh, with sulfate. Next, please. So where are all these things uh, occurring? So these are the domains. So all those little tiny freckles there are samples taken as part of the ambient groundwater project, and that's all published. You can download it all, that all yourself. So next slide, please. And you'll see those big round circles. Those things are the, the concentrations of hydrogen sulfide for all the data, not just the 41. So next, please. The 41 are shown there in, in red, and you can see that they cluster in certain areas. And I'm just going to sort of break them up in domain, into do domains. Next, please. So that one in the center of the Kettle Point formation, that is the uh, that is an area where there's there's uh, thin drift over top of the Kettle Point formation. There's young groundwaters coming into that very methaniferous aquifer. There's the water from that aquifer looks like champagne, as you might be, might be able to see there. It bubbles like crazy. It's full of methane, and we think that some there are some natural sulfates coming down from. Uh, from up on top, or it could be related to farming, but the point is it's not related to oil and gas wells, so we can ignore those for now. Next, please. And these ones here, these are very, very deep uh, wells, water wells that were drilled through the Hamilton Group, which is a kind of a, a grayish green there, and then and then into the Dundee, which is a, a gray, and then down below that into the first green where, there, which is the Lucas Formation. And that's presumably because the, the driller couldn't find any water in the shallower formations, and they hit the Lucas where there's lots of water, but that water is full of sulfate. So that sulfate came up, mixed with the shallow natural gas that's in the shallower formations, and pr produced uh, uh, produce H2S. And that's a problem for the owners of the wells, but it's not going to go anywhere because we already know that the, the, the driller, driller wouldn't, have kept, wouldn't have kept on drilling if there was water and, and, and an aquifer up there to, to pollute. So that's a problem for the people that have it, but that's not uh, gas well related, so we can strike those out. So next, please. Next slide, please. Thanks. So that's down in the Pelee Island area. Those ones up at the top, all those ones that don't have red circles on them, uh, in that, uh, in the top part of that oval, uh, those have honorable mention. They're just under ten, so they all are part of the same problem. By the way, inside that oval is both Wheatley and Marantet Beach, so these issues are, uh, are probably uh, they, there. Probably are some related to that. This could be related to sour gas. We don't know, uh, but um, we. Uh, the point is that it is related based on the isotopes, not just the sulfur isotopes. By the way, we have some carbon isotopes that are published. Again, you can download this all yourself and look at it. Uh, and so that problem is is related to gas wells. Pelee is a very interesting problem, uh, an issue, and it's very uh, it's it's the the, the uh, hydrostatic heads there are three meters above lake level. So there's some really interesting things happening, geologically speaking. Uh, but we don't have time to go into that. So next, please. So this one in the center, this these are the incised valleys of the Norfolk sand plain, and um, the we think the sulfate in this case is coming from intermediate strata. Uh, it's a problem that's uh, ongoing. It's uh, forestry farm roads in there. Uh, and then next next one, please. And so this is the Niagara Peninsula. Uh, there should be an oval, one more, I think. There, yeah. And so these, this has been the subject of two graduate theses. One was by Kate, Caitlin Small in 2017, and one was by Ted Matheson. And uh, he actually finished in 2011, and he published a, 
a paper in 2018. And so Caitlin's also got a uh, journal paper on this. This is a, a big, um, there's a, a number of different issues going on in there, but the point is here, you notice that the problems are not everywhere. They're only in certain areas. And this is really important when it comes to trying to resolve these issues. There are 27,000 wells in Southern Ontario and you don't want to be chasing them all down. So next slide, please. So uh, just to get a little philo philosophical here for, for a moment, Ontario uh, has the oldest oil and gas industry in the world, world arguably, uh, because the people of Pennsylvania argue it. They, argue, they claim that the, the first oil well was in 1859 in Pennsylvania, but we actually drilled one in 1858. So anyway, the point is that the, uh, the Ontario industry developed uh, right alongside those big industries in the U.S. And, uh, and over the next 50 years or so, the best drilling practices could not have been followed uh, because they hadn't been developed yet. They were thumping down every farmer that had a cable tool rig was hammering down uh, a well and getting gas on their property or not and probably leaving the open the hole open. And um, uh, cable tool rigs were easy to operate and they put in these these barrel stave uh, casings that could be 30 feet or 30 meters long to get the gas up to surface, but that was the extent of the casing. So um, after after that period, uh, uh, remarkably, the, the, the best practices had been pretty much developed and they were very similar to what we use nowadays, but the, the adequate decommissioning practices took another 50 years and that was right into the you know, late 50s, early 60s when that started happening everywhere, including Ontario. And so the point is that this is the serious problems that we have are not really anybody's fault. You can't blame them on any government or the government of the day or you know, greedy oil companies because it wasn't oil companies, it was farmers. Uh, and so, or, or you know, uh, regulators not following regulations, or there weren't regulations. So it's just a legacy. It's that we have to deal with. And I, uh, my point is, I think we can deal with it. So it's also important to realize that our industry is tiny compared to the other jurisdictions. Alberta, for example, has 450,000 recorded wells. Admittedly, most of them are in better shape since they were drilled since since uh, World War II. Next slide, please. And so to wrap up, I, I, I want to point out that when I started at Matrix, I was very surprised. In fact, I was flabbergasted to hear that Matrix had worked on tens of thousands of well abandonments out west. Uh, th those numbers staggered me. I, I had no idea that that, uh, that 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 amount of work, that that scale of work, could be done, especially by one company. And when you consider that Alberta decommissions 3,000 wells per year, and that one company alone, and presumably other companies too have supported tens of thousands of these, although they weren't in Alberta, weren't all in Alberta, but uh, that kind of puts these serious problems in perspective. We have big problems and some of them are more serious than some of the problems out West, but there are so few wells. We, relatively speaking, um, we probably, uh, of the 27,000 of the books that we have, only a small fraction are likely to be problematic. Uh, and we know, or, uh, uh, at least regionally, where these problems are going to be, because we can see them in the ambient groundwater data. So we know where to look, uh, we know how to do it, and and uh, and it's obviously being done on a scale far larger than this. So I think that with proper prioritization and ranking of these problem wells, there's, there's every chance that we can get a handle on this uh, in the not too distant future. I really think that's the case. And as I said earlier on, I didn't think that when uh, five years ago when I, or 10 years ago when I first started encountering these problems. So that's basically what I had to say.